Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel for another episode on uh, one of my favourite games which is of course uh, Upfront and today I'm going to be discussing um, some of the peculiarities of Japanese armour and how it is represented in the game. Now what prompted this video was a really interesting exchange I had uh, uh, with one of you about um, the armoured engagement video that I made some time ago. Um, my purpose at that time was to demonstrate um, how tank-on-tank -tank warfare worked in Upfront. Now at its heart, Upfront is an infantry combat game. The use of ordnance and tanks are, on the whole, I feel very well modelled, but they also sometimes have that sort of I don't want to say tacked on because that's a bit too dismissive, but while they've been very carefully worked into what is at heart an infantry game, you, you do find that odd stuff happens sometimes. And what I have in mind when I make that observation is the results of my armoured engagement video. Those of you who have seen it will remember that the Japanese won decisively. I had pitted a force of three Japanese armoured vehicles against three US armoured vehicles. And my expectation when I made the video was that the US would just steamroller over the Japanese, as they nearly always do, and, um, and, and that, you know, I would just be able to use this one-sided victory as a way of talking um, about um, how the armoured combat system works, particularly when you're pitting tank against tank rather than in an infantry support role. Now, I did get a one-sided victory, but much to my astonishment, the one-sided victory went to the Japanese. Now, just to give you an idea of how fluky this is, even in upfront terms, I, I have played um, Jap the Japanese side a lot. They're, they're a uh, nationality that really fascinates me. I've played Japan against Great Britain and Japan against the United States and Japan against the Soviet Union on many, many, many occasions. Um, but uh, including a number of times when uh, where it's basically been a tank battle, you know, for example, you, you could fight the Soviets uh, and recreate the terrible battle of Kalkin Gol. And I have done that. But on only one occasion have I ever seen Japanese armor triumph over its counterparts in an, uh, of another nationality. And that was in that video I made. I'm sure there's a there's a joke somewhere about how, you know, this sort of thing only happens when you've got a camera trained on them and you don't know how they're going to react. Um, but anyway, I was totally unprepared for that. But, you know, although I got a few rules wrong uh, making that video, uh, none of my mistakes had a particularly adverse effect on how the armour of both sides behaved. So, you know, it was a surprising victory. Um, and some time afterwards, it did generate a very interesting discussion about the the moment where I think it was the Type 97, the Chiha, had started off well by disabling the US Sherman tank. It basically knocked out a track and immobilized it. And then a couple of turns later, very convincingly put a round through it and destroyed it. And the problem with this was that in in real life, it shouldn't have happened. And my correspondent and I had quite a lively discussion about this. And it, it, it included, uh, uh, it got to a point where he sent me a link to a, a, one of Mark Felton's very helpful YouTube videos about tank warfare. Uh, and in that video, uh, it, it, there was a focus on the only arguably successful Japanese engagement of Sherman's with the Type 97. And in that battle, three improved Type 97s, the so-called Shinhoto large turret chihas, had managed to destroy one and cripple two Shermans. However, the Shermans in turn had managed to destroy all three um, Japanese tanks. And while the Japanese tanks had largely been reduced to flaming scrap, uh, with only a minority, <clears throat> excuse me, a minority of their crews surviving. 
the majority of the engaged US tank men survived. This needs further clarification. This was not a head-on engagement by any means. The Japanese had fought their tanks as effectively as possible in the circumstances. They had concealed themselves well. They had ambushed the US tanks and taken them completely by surprise. The US tanks were less than 40 yards distant with, when the Japanese opened fire. And the Japanese tanks had a bead directly at the less well-armoured flanks of the Shermans. So it was about as ideal conditions as could be managed. And yet the US ended up kind of getting the better of the engagement. Some might argue it was a, a Japanese victory simply because of the sheer difficulty um, Japanese tank men had of achieving such a, a result against Sherman. So when, when you consider this uh, one incident against a backdrop of an entire conflict where generally speaking, if US arm or British armor went head to head with their Japanese opposite numbers, and I should say Soviet as well, the Allied powers would almost inevitably win. And the question came up, what do you do to prevent anomalies like my um, my armoured engagement video happening without mangling the excellent game system that is up front too much? And, and this is a tricky one because you, while I'm always happy to come up with optional rules uh, for upfront, and it's a system that lends itself really, really well to this kind of thing, you don't necessarily want to fix something that ain't broken, but I'm, I'm afraid my one-off video indicates that there is a one in a million chance of something going quite wrong there. So after much discussion, my correspondent and I, um, apologies for not naming you. I know some people out there are a bit uncomfortable about having their names shouted across YouTube, but I trust you know who you are, sir, and that you have my deepest gratitude for a really interesting discussion on this topic and for the link to the Felton video. So this one is very much for you. Um, so I am going to forward an excellent idea that my correspondent made, uh, which is to simply change one rule for Japanese tanks in a very specific circumstance. So overall, it's not a game breaker, but it's worth just bearing in mind if you want to make the behavior and performance of Japanese armor even more realistic when it's, when it's facing heavier allied armor. And the rules modification is this. If a Japanese armored vehicle manages by some miracle to immobilize an allied tank, let, let's say, for example, a Sherman, ordinarily when an armored vehicle is immobilized in upfront, any future attack on it automatically benefits from being able to hit it well, the defender has to use their flank rating rather than their frontal armour rating. Now, in 9 out of 10 tank engagements in upfront, this makes sense. And in the European theatre, where one shot is very often one kill, unless you're a Stuart shooting at a Tiger tank uh, or something similar, um, generally this works. But very often in, in Pacific scenarios or Far Eastern scenarios or Manchurian scenarios, you will find the opposing tanks are head on. And it leaves the door a little too open for Japanese armour to kill heavier armour in a follow-up attack if they immobilise their victim first. So the suggestion is, if a Japanese tank immobilises its opponent... It does not immediately get the benefit of being able to attack their flank armor ratings. It first has to play a movement card against the target, um, which enables it to flank them. So all well and good, you've immobilized the allied tank, but you still have to get around it, unless there's some other scenario starting rule that allows you to ambush them from the beginning. Um, but broadly speaking, the suggestion is just build that extra layer of difficulty in for the Japanese. Now, I do want to nuance it a bit because, of course, not all Japanese tanks were created equal. 
So I've laid out all the Japanese armoured vehicles here because I would like to suggest that this rule about needing to flank an immobilised enemy tank um, needs a bit of qualification. So I'm going to eliminate the easy ones first. So here we have the Japanese Type 92 armoured car and the Japanese Type 1 um, armoured personnel carrier. This was a very rare beast. You saw very few of them in the Pacific War. The, the Japanese simply didn't build that many. But for the simple reason that they've only been armed with machine guns, this discussion does not apply to them in the slightest. So even though they're armoured uh, fighting vehicles, you don't have to worry about those two. I would also suggest that this rule should not apply to the Horni self-propelled gun or the Chi Nu um, Type 3 tank. Now, just a bit of historical context. As a number of nations did, the Japanese can use the, the fairly reliable Type 97 chassis to mount a much heavier gun. And effectively, they created a self-propelled gun. Now this had a this was a good development for them because it married a much more powerful gun to the fairly nimble Type 97 chassis. Now you you wouldn't go tank hunting with this thing normally. The Japanese tended to use them quite defensively. But in theory the weapon was powerful enough to penetrate the armor of a Sherman. So I would add the Type 1 to the um the list of vehicles that um are not bothered by my optional rule. You know, if this thing immobilizes a Sherman head-on, it is more than welcome to obliterate it in the next turn. And the same goes for the Chi Nu. Now, if people are playing fairly historically, you will not encounter this tank very often in upfront scenarios because it, the very first test model was ready to go at about the end of 1943, if I'm being generous. But hardly any of these were encountered outside the home islands. In fact, if any, they were all being reserved for the defence of the home islands. And of course, uh, um, history of how the war ended being what it is, Allied armour never went head to head against these things. As far as I'm aware, I'd be very happy to be corrected on that if I'm mistaken, but I don't think I am. But this, this, uh, um, if you if you imagine the Type One self-propelled gun that we've just looked at, the whole knee, but with a proper turret, um, which was not too badly armoured, but it was still on the very weak Chiha type chassis. This thing could, if it got its kick in first, beat up a Sherman in ideal conditions. And this is the other tank which does not need to worry about the special rule of, you know, flanking an immobilized tank. Like the Type 1 Honey, it can knock holes in it fairly easily. So we'll leave those two out. And that leaves us with the four tanks, which were pretty much the mainstay of the Japanese war effort in the Pacific, unluckily for them. So... You have the diminutive Type 97 tankette. This had a ridiculously weak gun, and quite rightly, it will probably even find it difficult to take on Stuarts. You never know. Moving up the scale, you get the Type 95, which really is not that much better an armoured vehicle. Um, an improvement on the tankette, but I mean, it's pretty much a tankette itself. So... I would say that one's definitely one that has to flank any Allied tank if it immobilizes it. And then, of course, we have the the um, Type 97 in both its original form, um, the original Chiha, with the 57 millimeter gun, but very low velocity 57 millimeter gun. So this gun actually had less chance of penetrating a Sherman's armor than the higher velocity uh, 47 millimeter. No, wait, I lie. Sorry, 37 millimeter. Ignore what I just said. Don't know why I said 50 there. Yep, 37 millimeter gun. That was fairly hopeless. And then, of course, we have the much discussed type uprated type 97 with the high velocity 47 millimeter but while these tanks reflect a steady improvement uh, 
we're really talking about pre-war designs really put together with the intention of coping with uh, tanks of the 1930s and then a design that is an attempt to improve one of these and give it a fighting chance against an enemy but even as these were ready they were behind the curve so these four tanks again are the ones that would need to play a flank card to get around even an immobilized um, US medium tank. Now I've still got to play test this a bit. The problem is I ever since I had the discussion surrounding um, the very problematic result of my armored engagement game, I have played, I think it's about seven or eight um, games replicating that one, the, the lineup in that battle. And the Japanese have lost every single one. So, <laughs> so the, the data is sort of leaning towards begging the question of whether this modification is necessary. I might say it's not strictly necessary, but I will say that it builds in that extra layer of realism. If you really want to get a sense of just how frustrating and hopeless it was for Japanese tank commanders to try and um, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with their allied opposite numbers, I do recommend applying this rule. Um, but I'd also put in a final modification, which is a scaling one. So, And you do have to have some knowledge of your tanks here to implement this properly. So these two here regardless of circumstances or unless it's an armored car a weak armored car with only machine guns will have to flank their opponent after immobilizing it the medium tanks or what the japanese call the medium tank would not have to flank something small like a Stuart, but they would have to flank a sherman so you have to make a bit of a judgment call on where you set the bar, but I think it's reasonable that while these two could knock out a Stuart without any modification to the upfront rules, when they're facing medium tanks or better, they would definitely have to. Now, I'm going to leave this there because I, I have been um, talking for quite a while to try and plug what is really just one alteration to one particular rule, but... Um, as with my previous video, which was optional rules for the um, uh, uh, representing the Highlanders in the British Army, interestingly, um, also sparked by the same gentleman who set me on this very, very interesting um, rabbit hole. Um, give this a try. I don't know if you feature armor very often in your upfront games or particularly Japanese armor. I mean, I've got to admit, for the most part, it's not fun um, driving the Japanese tanks unless you're facing opposition that either doesn't have them or has very weak ones. But give this a whirl. I would be very interested to know what you think if you do. Um, as ever, all feedback is welcome or, or indeed suggestions for how we might nuance this. Um, equally welcome are, um, you know, outraged cries of, no, there's nothing wrong with upfront, please don't do this. Um, those are equally welcome too. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I, I do love Japanese tanks for all their flaws and weaknesses. They are, I don't know what it is, there's just, I don't know if how many of you out there are fans of the Type 95. I love Type 95s. I think they're gorgeous. So I hope you found this interesting on that front. If, um, if, if you happen to be a fan of Japanese tanks or Second World War armored warfare uh, in general, um, I'd, I'd hope there'd be a bit of that in your blood if you're, uh, if you're a regular player of Upfront. But um, as I say, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this and hope you found it interesting. As always, it's really grand to have your company. Always like spending time with my upfront veterans. And um, it's always, always amazing uh, to me that so many of you tune into these videos. I'm really grateful. It, it makes it all so worth it. I really love doing these. And I, I really love the community that we've built up, sharing ideas, swapping stories. Um, uh, 
I do appreciate all of you setting me straight when I fluff up rules in Upfront, as I often do, but I'm working on that. But anyway, thank you all for your company. Thank you for watching this. Uh, it's hugely appreciated. And I do look forward to hearing from you, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you very much for tuning in. Bye.